two two questions for you, David. Um, one is to elaborate a little bit more. Um, you talked about the way in which um, the expansion created its own contradictions and, and has created created the crisis. Uh, a lot of people talk about this. This is this crisis is different and structural. Right. Um, and you talked a little bit about some of those factors. Well, I want you to elaborate a little bit on those. Two I'm thinking about. One is the sustained attacks. It's not just recently, but over 30 years, the attack on wages, working conditions, etc. Um, uh, which so we've had this massive increase in, in productivity, particularly over the last 20 years, without any corresponding increase in in, in wage levels in the. Um, particularly in the U.S., but true in other places as well. So that now um, there's this huge gap. Where's the, where's the consumer demand going to come from? You, you take the crisis, but for 25 years it's been done on, on credit cards. Mm -hmm. People can't sustain that anymore. So there's a lack of consumer demand. So that's one of the structural features. The other was the, 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 the past 30 years, has the big push to globalization, free trade, and so on. But that's had the consequence of hollowing out the US economy with a lot of manufacturing jobs disappearing, et cetera. Um, and the new jobs which people are getting, the New York Times had an article about this a couple of weeks ago, right? <laughs> are much, much lower paying than, than previously. Um, so where are the new jobs gonna, gonna come from? So, so uh, that's, that's a second sort of structural feature of the, of the current situation. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. And my other question has to do with um, alternatives, because you talked about, yeah, the uh, austerity, and that's, the, that's the, the line coming from ruling classes around, uh, around the world. Um, there is another program on offer, which is being pushed by Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, et cetera, which is a revival of Keynesianism. Uh, their argument is there's got to be massive levels of deficit spending by um, by central governments now um, that that can revive the economy it will um, it should be into infrastructure and new areas like green technology and so on and that's that's the way that they see the revival coming uh, and Krugman's argument is that the main obstacle to that is political it's not economic and that the austerity people are just you know economic illiterates basically right <laughs> um, so, can you comment on that? Is that a, is, is that is is the only obstacle to that political, or is that a viable economic strategy? I'm happy to take a few questions. So, if you will, others should jump in. I did do a lot of talking. More hands. I'll just follow up on the last point. Uh, if the problem is overaccumulation, that is we have too much productive capacity relative to other elements in the system, it's not too much in terms of human mm -hmm. needs, it's just too much relative capacity of the system. That is the classic characterization of the Keynesian problem mm -hmm. as well. But to say that the obstacle is only political, Of course, everything is only political in one sense, but it implies that the massive expansion of government programs to fill that gap uh, could be done in a way that doesn't harm the interests, the economic interests of capital. So the, the, that is, I don't, I think the reason it isn't just political in the simple sense of just political is because it would have to be redistributed. Now, I think it, a really smart ruling class that has a long-term view of what it will take to reconstruct a stable capitalism that doesn't just tear itself to pieces might indeed say, yes, this is a time now we've had 30 years of redistribution upwards. Now we need a, a decade of some redistribution downwards. If, if you had a wise <laughs> ruling class that wasn't myopic, perhaps you know, that could be a coherent mm -hmm politics uh, that could indeed be a way out of the crisis, I think. But uh, that would require a change in the both the time horizons and the self-interested perspective of capitalists, and certainly in the US, that is, seems completely off the agenda. There's also a hand over here. Are there any others? Yeah, the quick comment on the Keynesian stuff. Like, 
Krugman's column on Monday was talking about the miracle of the 40s, like how great it was because the war meant that we could actually get the stimulus we needed. So it's almost as if, like, I don't know, what's the implication there? Should we be moving for another world war? Um, but I, I want to ask a question about uh, China. And you, talk, you talked a bunch about the, you know, the structural overcapacity of the Chinese economy. But one thing you didn't touch on as much is the way that, the US, or that China has been sort of seeing itself as eclipsing the US as a world banker. So they're flushing all of these dollars um, and have been gobbling up contracts, developmental contracts all across the world, Africa, Latin America, et cetera, and even to the US to a certain degree. So I'm curious if you could talk about what, what that means in terms of the relative power relationship between the US economy and the Chinese economy. And um, you know, if you think this is a, the, the sort of perspective that China's taking for how they can continue that drive to overtake the US. Uh, and then the, the, the second thing is the New York Times had a really um, kind of in-depth article about the state sector in China starting to play a much bigger role again. And I'm curious if you think that's a result of private capital fleeing because of the recession generally and the Chinese state being able to take over what they would have been doing or if it represents a, a political shift back in the direction of more interventionist economics in a sustained way by the Chinese state. Um, so I, I'm curious to know what you think of the monthly review take on, on these things, because I see some similarities in your argument to theirs, in particular this notion that the great boom was the exceptional thing and not the benchmark to compare things to. But the idea that these are mature economies, particularly with the United States, and that it's, it's in a, a state of constant over-accumulation, um, and that this is very much to do with the monopoly character of capital and all of that. So I'm curious, I mean, I see some similarities, but some differences, and I'd like to hear you elaborate a little bit on your different perspective. Um, I'd be curious as to uh, your perspective, uh, looking at things a little more parochially. Um, ultimately, there may, you know, there, there may be a return or an establishment of a new sort of homeostatic state. Um, <coughs> or one where there's more predictability as to what's going forward. Um, but in reaching that point, is it likely that with the distribution and globalization of, of goods, services, et cetera, that the US um, will never return to what it came to think of, or what we came to think of as the norm, even as the world manages to return to some some level of, of uh, productivity, consumption, and so on that, that is, is making the global the global uh, community happy. The U.S. just simply is past its zenith, and as things return, that the uh, the wealth has shifted elsewhere, the productivity has shifted elsewhere, et cetera, the accumulation, and that we simply are not going to be able to return to anything that would look similar to the, well, the last half century or more, the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start in reverse order there, picking up from that, because it, it's a nice way into a lot of these questions. And part of the problem is that what we're describing when we do this sort of level of analysis is a series of constraints on capital. And it's important to recognize that because we often you know, too easily describe capitalism as a system run by capitalists. And the idea that they are actually regularly constrained by logics and, that get out of their own control is something really important to recognize. Capital profits from the system but the system has its own mechanisms and dynamics that they struggle to influence. Um, I start there because if you ask me on the basis of economic trends alone, I would have to say, yeah, I think what you've said is correct. That is to say that the U.S. economy, if we simply take economic trends, will not play the same role over the next 50 years in the world system as it has over the last. By the way, I hope that over the next 50 years we do something to dramatically and radically transform that world system. But we're going to bracket that till tomorrow's discussion in more detail. 
Um, but, of course, politics matters enormously. And part of politics is the use of force. And I'm really struck that already in the business pages of the most important uh, sort of capitalist paper in Canada, the Globe and Mail, there is one columnist who just repeatedly says, it's going to war, folks. That's the logic. This has to be resolved militarily. Um, now, at this point, he you know, comes across as half wing nut and so on in the debate. But who think of the want, logic. Who does he want Canada to attack? Well, yeah. no, actually, his, <laughs> it, his, his is the classic Canadian ruling class attitude, which is basically stay really, really close to the U.S. because they got most of what it takes to win. <laughs> but against whom? Uh, but, you know, the, yeah, exactly. The, and, and really, it's me nervous. Well, yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, what he's raising is the fact that if there is going to be a viable accumulation strategy for the American ruling class, this is going to mean the use of force to grab resources. Okay? So that's why I say we can't just work on the economic trends which constrain. Because at some point all these economic trends get worked out geopolitically as well. Uh, you know, it's an entirely other aspect of all of this. Um, but coming back, so and, and by the way, I have no idea how any of that will resolve itself. And the question of where, you know, where China is over a period of 20 years is enormously significant uh, you know, in the economic, but also the geopolitical realm. Extremely significant. And we should never rule out very rapid and fast reconfigurations of global power because there is a discussion uh, in Europe, for instance, that the European ruling classes need to be a lot closer to China than they have been. And I'm not saying that's where they're going, but the point is the discussion is out there and the debate is out there. But in, if, I, if I'm right that we're talking about <clears throat> a period in which it is extremely difficult for the global economy to revitalize itself, then the tensions between different blocks in the capitalist system be, will tend to get more intense. It will also mean alliances between different blocks, and these get very complicated. It's why I talked about Japan and China as different centers of accumulation, even though they fall within East Asia because there's also enormous long-standing geopolitical rivalry there. So I, I, you know, I think what the, your question, in other words, moves us to another level of, of discussion, uh, which gets very tricky and very difficult. In terms of the crisis, and particularly the Keynesian program, because that ran through several questions, you see, there's a great, really appealing logic uh, to the new Keynesian program. The problem is it doesn't really think in terms of capitalism, it thinks in terms of an entity called the economy. Okay, without classes and without internal conflicts. And if you are to say, if we accept the existence of this entity, then you can say, is it better to revitalize the economy by cutting government spending or expanding it? Well, that's a pretty easy one. The economy, in quotes, does better if you expand government spending. The problem is it is not an economy. It is a capitalist economy. And to spend through government means to shift the center of growth away from private capital to public institutions. It is then to raise the question of what are the purposes of these public institutions? What ought they to be doing? If we accept that the private sector and the market is not the engine of growth, this opens up a whole series of political questions that were ruled out of order mm -hmm. and right off the table for a whole historical period. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are all kinds, and that's why I really agree that this it becomes a political question in this sense, Eric, as you were saying. 
earlier. The other problem is, if you were to give the Keynesians their day, the kinds of people that Phil was talking about, Paul Krugman and Joe Stieglitz and so on, and somehow they could run the economic agenda of the US government, they, they confront a problem very, very early on, which is that if you embrace the Keynesian agenda and if you say we're going to spend our way out and this requires effectively using government debt, which it does, you've got to pay for it so you sell, you sell government debt to bring in the income, to bring in the revenues with which to fund these great programs. How do private financial markets react? This was Greek, the Greek dilemma. Yeah. It's not true that the Socialist Party of Greece, PESOK, said coming in, we're just going to kick the daylights out of, the social, uh, out of social welfare programs in Greece. They believed they could get away with some very moderate Keynesian social welfare reforms at the, engine, at, at, at the margins. And financial markets came in and said, no. You keep spending like this, you keep floating debt, we're going to dump it. We're going to sell it off and you're going to have a financial crisis. We're not going to buy the stuff. And I am in the camp. Some of my colleagues at York do not entirely agree with me on this, so I have to be honest. But I'm in the camp that says the capacities of the US state in this regard are not infinite. That they too face constraints. <clears throat> and you could get a major run, effectively a major run on the US dollar. If somehow the Keynesians just thought, we'll just keep trying to sell treasury bills to do it. It also brings into, in other words, financial markets have a capacity to discipline, I believe, even the American state by saying, your credit's no good, you gotta offer higher interest rates to sell this stuff, and that's what was happening with Greece, your stuff is junk. Therefore, since it's junk bonds you're selling, we demand an 8% return, not a 4% return, and so on. They, I think they can produce a financial crisis for the US. But most significantly, it raises big issues around the long-term viability of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And I think that's a huge issue long-term if you try to pursue that agenda. Now, you could say, I don't think these Keynesians want to go this far. You could say, fine, capital controls. <clears throat> you could say, we don't allow capital to flee. The government simply takes control of the globalization of finance. Oh, and you might have to nationalize some banks <laughs> to carry this through and so on. So what's interesting is that agenda keeps raising the stakes. And I think that, you know, in all kinds of ways, it would be great to have that debate mm -hmm. and that discussion, but it's important for the left to realize that you can't just say, come on in and do Keynesian policies, because in a global capitalist system, they will start to punish you for it, and then you've got to have some balance of social and class forces where you can actually push the agenda further at that point. So, fine. You say we can't do green jobs, we can't create 11 million jobs through the public sector and so on, fine. Capital controls, control the banking system, and so on. Uh, but of course, you can't even begin to move there without a massive shift in the balance of social forces in, uh, in society. And I think that's what the Keynesian debate is just a policy debate ignores. The policy debate ultimately becomes a serious political debate about the purposes of public institutions about who controls social policy and in whose interest. And this is where, interestingly, China does come in in terms of this question around uh, the dollar, because they're the biggest holders of dollars in the world. And it's really, really interesting. In the early stages of the crisis, China fired a series of shots across the US bow. Very, very early on, they said, you know, we may have to move away from the dollar as a key reserve currency in the world. And they serve notice. By the way, they serve notice in such a way that the US government therefore had to move very, very quickly to prop up Fannie Mae, um, because Chinese held a lot of its debt, for instance. Um, but interestingly, a couple of months ago, 
the Chinese uh, premier came out and said, China has for the time being rejected the nuclear option where the dollar is concerned. <laughs> now, what an interesting formulation. <laughs> okay. That's to acknowledge that there is a nuclear option. Now, it hurts China to go the direction of the nuclear option because the nuclear option means to dump dollars. Well, that means to devalue your own asset because the Chinese hold so much of it. But we shouldn't be under illusions that the Chinese think they, should, they ought to forever accept U.S. dollars under any circumstances. Isn't it the case that the longer they do that the harder it becomes? I think that's true unless they get to a point where they simply decide we'll take a hit. We're prepared to take a hit in the short run. And I'll, I just simply think, Patrick, that's not out of the question if we're thinking over a 10 and 20 year time period. Um, they, they clearly want to decenter the dollar over time. And they would prefer a gradualist program where a basket of currencies start to serve. That's why they're letting the renminbi now start to be used in external transactions. It's developing a little bit of a world money capacity. Uh, it's why they started to diversify more into euros a while ago and so on. So all this is simply a long-winded way of saying that the question that I started with, the state of the U.S. economy and where it figures in the world, is fraught with some big, big questions about the global financial order and the monetary system globally. And I think, if I were to put it in these terms, the purely economic logic of capitalism is for the dollar to be slowly demoted but not retired. That's the long term, that's sort of the, the economic logic over a decade or more, that you would eventually probably have three world currencies that would play significant and substantial roles in lubricating the world economy. But the geopolitical process of moving towards that would be very, very interesting and very, very complicated. Um, but all of, all of this constrains the capacities of the US state, and I believe they are more constrained by the dynamics and the competitive pressures of the world system than some analyses of empire today suggest. Uh, there were, okay, we have Eric, and then there was a hand over here, and there were others, please. please. Just had one sort of follow-up comment on the character of the class constraints, the full gambit of the class constraints. You emphasize that the uh, deficit spending version of the find your way out will you think that the global finance constraint will kick in sooner than Copeland does for example right. mm -hmm. uh, there is an alternative to deficit spending which is given how much idle funds there are yes. we can increase taxes on the rich without it having a corresponding impact on demand and therefore use that increased tax revenue for public sector jobs which would also be Keynesian in the sense of redirecting. Uh, but then the class constraint is because of the anti-redistributive asset. Right. Um, now given that, however, given that the US has the lowest tax rates in the world, there's a huge kind of room to maneuver on taxation that is purely ideological and political, really constrained. You know, not even remotely economically constrained. Um, the Tea Party, of course, is the specter that <laughs> has really blocked that temporarily. But it is a it is a natural kind of solution out of this, given the for the US economy, not so much for the European economies, but the US economy, given how low taxes are here, uh, would be to increase tax on taxes on these idle funds, which wouldn't hurt investment because they're not being invested anyway. But then could be used without generating these De deficit problems. If you are, if you're right that the deficit constraint would kick in sooner, you know, Krugman's right, that wouldn't be necessary. Mm -hmm. but, but that's also a class constraint. Yeah. In the corner. So, um, I'm oh, two things, David. One, I was wondering if you could just uh, elaborate a little bit more on this idea of Newton neoliberalism, mm -hmm. um, because. Um, I mean, I think I see kind of where you're going with that idea. I mean, in some ways, it seems like some of the, the policies of the Obama administration, you, you sort of see that in action. I mean, you know, they're spending, on the one hand, a whole 26, I think, $26 billion 
to restore teachers' jobs by taking that money out of food stamps, mm -hmm. right. uh, out of 16 billion of, of it, out of food stamps. I wonder if that that process of taking from one um, pie and, and putting it in the other, if that if that's sort of along, goes along the line of what, of what you're talking about. Also curious about the how capital markets would respond to further stimulus. Um, but the other question I have, which is maybe you know, it is a geo question about geopolitics. Is I think a lot of people on the on the left sort of welcome the idea that the crisis is sort of the simple signal of the decline of U.S. economic and military power, and and, and is going to help to usher in sort of a multipolar mm -hmm. world, um, in a world which which I think that the argument, the claim would be made, you know. Um, Imperialism, uh, war, uh, et cetera, and, and so forth, would be, you know, we, we wouldn't have those, those kinds of those kinds of troubles. Um, Dil Piero, I think, kind of makes that case in his book, but I think the other variations of the argument. And I wonder if you could comment on that question first. First, I'm not sure that you're making the argument that we're entering a multipolar right. world. But if you could just comment on the geopolitical implications of a crisis that I, I agree very much with, you, with your characterization that it's mutating rather than uh, 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 static. Okay, so we are going to uh, have David give a response to these last two questions, and then we will call it a night. Okay, I'm going to remember that uh, coming to the uh, Haven Center, you only get the big tough questions. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot, uh, but it's great. And starting really, Eric, with what you were saying, I, I think that that's absolutely right. That is to say, while I think the defi deficit constraint is perhaps more significant than some of the Keynesian commentators do, there is an obvious alternative, which is to say we don't have to use deficit spending because I mentioned 1.3 trillion sitting idly in the banking system, for instance. Uh, tax it, rechannel it, and so on. And there's no question that in some ways there is a lot to command to that kind of program and that kind of argument. I mean, I, I will admit to have got, having gotten very tired over the years when every May Day and every Labor Day I saw a left group that had the same slogan you know, for 30 years, make the rich pay, um, every time I went to an action. But actually, it fits in this particular <laughs> moment. It's sort of like you know, the stopwatch that's still right twice a day. Um, you know, this moment has arrived where, yeah, make the rich pay for their bailouts, uh, rather than the working class and, and, and the poor. I think, that's, I think that's right. And what you have to then do is talk about those issues that we were touching on earlier about how this is only possible by building mass sustained social movements which can actually deliver a degree of pressure through mobilization and of course then have all of the empowering effects that that happens. I mean for those historians for example who have talked about the New Deal from below the insurgency that it took in unions, unemployed movements, and so on, uh, to make social reform happen, that uh, had various pro-labor aspects and so on. I think that, I think that's what we're talking about. And it, you know, that's again, it takes us back to this question of politics. In terms of neoliberalism, I'll put it really baldly, even though it's too simple, but I think maybe we'll give you a sense of what I'm driving at. Uh, I think neoliberalism suffered an ideological defeat without suffering a really profound political and economic defeat. In other words, all the market ideology stuff really took a huge hit. The claims for the wonders of free markets and you know, the numbers of people out there who know that what was going on at Goldman Sachs for instance, was not like the wonders of free markets folk stuff that the neoliberals had taught them. That basically you have the financially and economically powerful simply exploiting institutions um, and using power to accumulate. 
and I think that came through really nakedly. And so I think this is, you know, this is part of the moment that they, they, they have not suffered the level of political and economic setbacks that a sustained wave of social protest and social mobilization might have inflicted, where you start to really see the balance of social forces shifting within society. But I think ideologically they're hugely disarmed. And it's, it's a huge issue for the left that that ideological disarming takes place in a context in which we haven't been able to sh sufficiently shift that balance of class forces. And that's why I say I think that's what we're talking about over a longer period uh, than, uh, than I certainly hoped uh, a couple of years ago where I thought, okay, the left will move perhaps more quickly. Um, and you're, you're totally right, Aaron, on this one that, you know, my position is not a, a simple move, you know, crisis, therefore multipolar world. Uh, I think that's too simple. And I think there's a tendency in a lot of the analyses we've had to seize on one side of a very complex social process. So you seize on one trend and then simply extrapolate. So you've got either the invincible U.S. empire or the interminably declining one. And I think it's a much more complex configuration, actually. And the way I would put it is this, that I believe that rather than any other block in the world system challenging the US, that's a scenario I don't see in any short order, I think that blocks are likely to emerge which are going to try to constrain the US without challenging and displacing it. And I think that is part of the shift that this period represents. So it's neither the US can completely get its way on everything, you know, the kind of super imperialism empire that has no, no constraints, but neither is it an overnight decline in displacement by somebody else, someone else. And Giovanni Arrighi was maybe the closest to suggest that China would quickly displace the US. I don't, I don't think that's right. But I do think moves to constrain US power in the interests of other sections of global capital is part of this scenario that we're likely to see. Thank you.